throughout its history, Russia has annexed foreign lands, colonizing indigenous nations, destroying their national identity, then using these same nations to seize new territories and enslave other nations. As we see today, in the 21st century, the methods that Kremlin used almost 500 years ago just do not change. And it does not matter what the state is called. Ancient Muscovia, the Russian Empire, the Soviet Union or the Russian Federation, the essence remains the same. Today, just as in the past, other enslaved peoples, the Kazan Tatars, who have been under the Russian occupation for almost 500 years, give their lives for the imperial ambitions of the Kremlin, apparently completely forgetting how several centuries ago the Muscovites killed their ancestors and annexed their homelands. And after the annexation, those who survived it were forced to forget the atrocities of the Kremlin, the history was rewritten, cultural heritage destroyed, their very life repressed. The Kremlin is literally driving a minority into the army through economic pressure and, as a matter of fact, is expanding the empire through their hands. All non-Russian nations in Russia are considered second-class people. We are just a Russian empire, a fertilizer for it. We also are a colonized nation. We have a starting point in 1552 and the capture of Kazan. And Moscow colonized the internal territories of Eurasia and considered it obligatory, first to economically deprive the Kazan Hanate of its main resource. 500 years ago, they finally managed to conquer the Kazan Hanate, and from that time, slavery began, which continues to this very day. Putin is much worse than the Soviet regime. By the way, probably he is like Stalin's. Tatarstan must be the first to declare its withdrawal from the so called Russian Federation. After the president of the Russian Federation announced mobilization throughout the country, including in the Republic of Tatarstan, people began to be massively taken for military registration to enlistment offices to be sent to war with Ukraine. They were taken from everywhere, from homes, from educational institutions, just from the street. The response to the mobilization was quite obvious and did not differ much from any other regions. It was, of course, a state of utter chaos. But here were protests in Tatarstan. Of course, the repressive apparatus works much more harshly in national republics and in Tatarstan in particular than in Moscow or in any other so-called Russian regions. And here we can imagine such a picture as, uh, you know, Tatarstan is such a state within a state. We really are a sovereign republic. That is why all this local control over the FSB, the Minister of Internal Affairs and so on, our government is subordinate to the Moscow government. And for them, it is of course much easier this way to control society, to mobilize security forces, to disperse any protest and so on. However, protests took place in Kazan. I must say that our protests in Tatarstan are always quite young. Young people are very politically active in Tatarstan. And in these first days after the announcement of the mobilization, protests and single pickets took place, unlike in other parts of Russia, and continue in Kazan to this day. <laughs> The worst thing for Tatarstan was that in the first days of mobilization, country closed its borders for men who qualify and fall in the mobilization criteria. And again, this is a perfect illustration of this repressive apparatus in action. With its help, it is so easy to drive people away, deprive them from their homeland and freedom of choice. Most likely, Tatarstan has fulfilled the Kremlin's plan. The sealed borders contributed to this. You know, I think that the invasion of Ukraine was such a culmination of the Kremlin's policy of colonization. First of all, the Kremlin is trying to mobilize representatives of indigenous nations from national republics without touching Moscow or St. Petersburg, Kazan Tatars, 
were no exception. Back in the days, they were mobilized into the ranks of conventional Russian troops. And surprisingly for many, there are a lot of representatives of small indigenous colonized nations. The Kremlin is deriving minorities into the army through economic pressure and, in fact, is expanding the empire through their hands. In fact, the same thing happened with mobilization. It was mobilized to Tatarstan, revolted, shouted, swing the regime, answer us. Красавчики! Those previously mobilized has left the country. They've been living here for about two months, and they have their guns with them. It turns out that they ran away from the front. People of Tatarstan helped them out with money, and I am very grateful to them for not participating in hostilities, for them to have left the front. This proves a lot. I talk to them sometimes. They openly say that this is someone else's war. We don't want this war. All non-Russian nations in Russia are like a second-class ones. We are just fertilizer for the Russian Empire. Mainly, it is not Russians who are fighting against Ukraine. This only means we are just a firewood for them. They are just throwing us into the furnace of this war. There is also a problem when we talk about Tatars, when we talk about list of dead people and list of mobilized. How to say they are Tatars? Most of our data is classified, everyone here knows that. And how to identify Tatars among even the least we have is a big question. From open sources published by the Ministry of Defense of Ukraine, the Russian army has already lost more than 100,000 soldiers and officers killed. Most of them are representatives of indigenous nations from national republics that are currently part of the Russian Federation. I think we won't know the real data anytime soon. This will happen only after the collapse of Russia. This is an absolutely criminal colonial war against sovereign Ukraine. We should remember this, and we should not forget about the Tatars and their own history, that we are also a colonized nation. We have a starting point in 1552, and the capture of Kazan is a very tragic date that every Tatar knows about. More than 190 nations live on the vast territories of the Russian Federation. Most of them are indigenous nations who were enslaved and colonized in different periods of history. And how did Kazan Tatars even become part of Russia? As I have already said, Kazan was captured in 1552. But before that, there were several attempts to take Kazan, which were unsuccessful. In the winter of 1547, Moscovite set out on a campaign to capture Kazan. The main force of the Moscovite was siege artillery. In order to deliver all these guns to Kazan, the colonizers had to move along the frozen Volga River. Due to the early thaw, the ice could not withstand the weight of the heavy guns and all the main artillery of the Muscovites went under the ice. Part of the troops that reached Kazan could not storm the city. Kazan citizens managed to defend their city valiantly. The survived remnants of the Russian forces were forced to return to Moscow without nothing. At that time, the Kazan Khanate was like a bone in a throat for Russian authorities, the Muscovites. The next attempt to take Kazan was made in 1550, immediately after the news of the death of the Kazan Khan Safagiri. Muscovites again attempt to seize Tatar lands, but again they fail. Suyum Bike, Safagire's mother, highs the reign of the sun and heads the Kazan kingdom, was able to protect her people and the city. Kazan survived again. Sun Bike is an example of such a Tatar lioness who fought for her state to the last. But the colonialists did not give up the hope of capturing the city. Their troops did not have enough provision and could not quickly replenish ammunition. The supplies quickly ran out which made it impossible for the invaders to organize a long-lasting siege of Kazan city. The distance from Kazan to Moscow is more than 800 kilometers, so in order to feed themselves, Moscovites looted Tatar settlements, but this did not completely solve the problem. So the invaders decided to build, just a 30 kilometers away from Kazan, a fortress, which became an outpost for the further attack on the Tatar capital and in which the colonialists began to accumulate resources for a new offensive. That is how, in the year 1551, the city of Sviyarsk has been established. The Kazan Khanate tried to make it to a peace treaty and a deal with Moscow. They concluded it in 1551, and part of this was Sim Bike's remarriage and her departure from Kazan. In 1551, Sim Bike was forcibly captured by the Murzas. This is the nobility of the Kazan Khanate. This was Moscow's demand, and they gave it to her son, Temesh Yarei. 
who was born in marriage to Safagiri, a Crimean prince who ruled in Kazan. She is given away and sent to Kasimov. This is a Moscow puppet state by that time, in fact, where she is forcibly married to Shah Ali. Her reign was short, it was simply tragic, and her fate in general reflected the entire tragic fate of the Tatar people. Forced removal, sons baptized, then sons' death, and life, and in fact demise away from the homeland. Therefore, it has become such a symbol of the tragedy of the whole Tatar nation. But Russia, as we know, does not keep its word. Therefore, in 1552, the Russians besieged Kazan again. It was a very long siege. This is illustrious example to a question whether it is possible to agree to some kind of truce with the Kremlin and with the Russians. In October 1552, Moscow then used the betrayal of a number of Tatar princes and also used dynamite as a weapon for the first time. For this purpose, Italian specialists were specially involved. Technology was never a strong part of Russia, not then nor now. So at first the Italians blocked the spring that supplied defenders of Kazan with fresh water. And secondly, they blew up this wall. And Russian troops broke in along with some Tatar traitors who believed that they would be given power like it was given to Shah Ali. The cleansing among Tatars took place for a long time. At some point Ivan the Terrible, who had already set foot there in the fortress, he was afraid of the mountains of corpses. The remaining alive were still there shouting and fighting, so the Tsar fled in fear. It is believed that his confessor, Sylvester, then grabbed him and scolded him. Are you kin or the cowardly? After that, they cleared the way for the Russian Tsar of the corpses to the main Kazan palace for three days. And after that, for several years, Kazan and the Kazan Hanate were actively cleansed from all that stutter and Christianized. Chronicles write that the waters of the Kazanka river, which flows through Kazan, were often scarlet with blood. After taking Kazan, the Russians killed almost all the men who stayed there. In fact, from this moment, first of all, the violent Christianization of the Tatars begins. Many people were evicted from Kazan. Secondly, a ban on land ownership is adopted, and so on. They just had to take it, because the Silk Road was nearby, so it was an outpost. After the fall of the Kazan Hanate, the Astrakhan Hanate, the Siberian Hanate, and so on and so forth fell. And the Russians went to Siberia, to the Urals. And Moscow colonized the internal territories of Eurasia and considered it obligatory, first of all, to economically deprive the Kazan Hanate of its main resource. The fact that it was located on the territory of the major Volga road to the Caspian Sea, it was trading with the Polossians, with the Negeis, and so on and so forth, and most importantly, with fur. 500 years ago, and yet the Russians managed to conquer the Kazan Hanate. And from that time, slavery began, which continues to this day. This is both physical destruction and moral, as well as cultural destruction. The Russians have set out to conquer and assimilate my people. In general, mass repression. And of course, as it was then in the 1930s, the entire intelligentsia was slaughtered. In general, the spiritual heritage, Islam, was prohibited, and this godlessness atheism and everything else was being imposed. The Holodomor is again the Volga region, which Moscow, of course, like the Ukrainian Kazakh Holodomor, does not like to talk about. It is just that the Soviet system has taken it all from people, while selling grain to the West to buy weapons and everything else. But the Tatars have several times raised the question that they should not have autonomy, but an allied Soviet state status instead. In 1936, before Stalin's constitution, in the 1950s, in the 1960s, five times in total, they were promised every size, because the potential, for example, for the GRP, Gross Regional Product of the Tatar Autonomy, exceeded the indicators of six Soviet republics. Then and now it still exceeds that of six Russian republics. It was only in the late 80s that Gorbachev agreed that the Union Treaty would be re-signed and Tatarstan would receive the long-awaited Union status. All this time Tatarstan was in a very difficult situation. 98% of everything we produced and earned was given to Moscow. During the perestroika of the collapse of the Soviet Union, Kazan Tatars again hoped for gaining freedom and reviving statehood. In the 90s, political parties and movements for independence and sovereignty that were not controlled by Moscow appeared and developed rapidly in Tatarstan. Вы возьмите ту долю власти, которую сами можете проглотить. 
residents of Tatarstan voted to secede from Russia in the 1990s, and here, in 1994, the background in the first Russian invasion of Chechnya and Tatarstan agrees to conclude a federal treaty with Moscow. Most likely, this was also due to the fear that Tatarstan would be next in line and Moscow would come and bomb Kazan, which of course would be a very likely scenario. At that time, everything was under control of the KGB, so there was no other way out then. They have found that way in Chechnya, when they have driven all the KGB from their republic. But the Tatars failed to do this. To calm things down, they threw both Chechnya and Tatarstan with money, because Tatarstan is in general an outpost of Russia. Tatarstan is the richest republic among all the constituent entities of the Russian Federation. When we declared our independence, when we were still independent, although not on 100%, everything back then was almost fully gasified. Roads, factories and farms were fully operational, and we even resolved all issues in the sports and social sectors. But after Putin came, the leadership of Tatarstan was brought to its knees. It turns out that we have been contributing 870 billion rubles to the federal budget in Moscow. This is a huge amount. With the arrival of Putin we have been driven very hard again and are now simply being trampled on, even more than in the Soviet Union. The most vivid example of the destruction of Tata identity is taking place in modern Russia. And here we should understand that if there were at least some Tata schools under Soviet, yes, the urban intelligentsia was fully russified. Of course, but the Tata language was preserved in villages and so on. But in modern Russia, the policy is way more radical. We have almost no Tata schools where education is conducted in the Tata language, and Tata is practically not used in everyday life. None of this is the case right now. Now it is impossible to take the unified state exam in Tatar or to study in Tatar. That is, there is no possibility of receiving education in the Tatar language at all. Putin is far worse than the Soviet regime, by the way, probably like Stalin's. Of course language is alive as long as it is alive in everyday communication, as long as you can use it. And this is where Tatar, despite all effort, dies out simply because people cannot use it every day. The situation is complicated and I compare it to Stalin's Talents Times. The full-scale invasion of sovereign Ukraine by the Russian Federation on February 24, 2022 shuddered the whole world. Many countries have begun to think about their own security, enter into new military alliances and review defense budgets. But certain processes have also begun to take place in the Russian Federation itself. Many opposing politicians, public figures, activists and representatives of different nations have begun to think about the security and future of the nation. The indigenous nations of the Russian Federation organized the Forum of Free Nations of Russia, where their cousin Tatars are represented by Rafis Kashapov's twin brother, Nafis Kashapov. This is a historic fact. The fact that this forum after the collapse of the Soviet Union is the first time ever takes place in Prague and it is being held at the highest level. This is a historical moment, what is happening today. That is, such a support for colonized nation. This applies not only to Tatars, but to all nations that live in Russia, who have wealth literally inside their own lands, for example the peoples of Siberia. These include the Caucasian nations, who actually fed the Soviet Union. Today we are feeding Putin's fascist regime. It is clear that Ukraine will win. Ukraine's victory means the freedom for colonized nations. Just like the Forum of Free Nations of Russia, the League of Free Nations is being created almost simultaneously by representatives of various indigenous nations that are now a part of the Russian Federation, in which Kazan Tartars are represented by Nafis Kashapov, Rafis Kashapov's native brother. Putin has crossed all lines. The collapse of Russia is inevitable. We know how the Soviet Union fell apart. Historical facts already prove this. We are waiting for this moment and we are working creating conventions, forums, organizing conferences and holding street events all over the world. But we are working not only on a Tatarstan scale, we work across the Urals, Siberia and the Caucasus. To this end, we have established contacts with representatives of indigenous and colonized nations of Siberia, the Caucasus and the Urals. There can be no compromise with the Russian authorities, only the full independence of Tatarstan and also Tatarstan must be the first to declare their secession from the so-called Russian Federation. We created two guerrilla groups about four months ago. They started protests, began to set fire to cars with signs Z and V. They even were traveling to other republics and began to set fire to military registration and enlistment offices. There were a lot of such movements there. 
за эти буквы. In the past and in the present, we have been making sure that our citizens, the residents of Tatarstan, do not participate in hostilities for the sake of Moscow's ambitions. All means are good here. Guerrilla movements are needed and explanatory work is needed as well. God willing, a forum will be held at the European Parliament and at the European Parliament in January 31st. Free nations hold its own events. This is a historic moment. For the first time, we representatives of colonized peoples will participate. I'm getting prepared too. This is such a high rostrum for us. We want to voice our problems of national, religious, economic, financial character that are related to the war between Ukraine and Russia to the whole world. Many thanks to Ukrainian public and political leaders, even to the deputies of the Rada. When we appealed to the President Volodymyr Zelensky and deputies of the Rada, so they recognized our statehood. Our documents were adopted by the Verkhovna Rada. We are very grateful to Ukrainians, because they were the first to adopt such an important document from us, Kazan Tatars. We have high expectations that in the future Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland and other countries in Europe and America and England will recognize the independence of the Republic of Tatarstan. My dear Tatars, my dear compatriots, you fall to the Kremlin's bait. You are made accompliances in the terrible crime of murdering innocent Ukrainian citizens. Ukraine did not attack Russia, did not attack Tatarstan. I believe that there is always a choice here, no matter what you say. You can run away, you can go to jail, but there is no forgiveness for those who set foot on Ukrainian soil with weapons in their hands. Therefore, I want to say that I want to remind the Tatars that they have a choice and that this is not our war. It is a war for some mythical Russian world to which, firstly, we have nothing to do with us as a nation and which, moreover, oppressed us for centuries. Dying for it is simply absurd and disrespect for our own roots and traditions to say it the least. We Tatars also have our own language. This means that we are a people. We are Tatars and we have our ancient culture, customs and traditions. So we are a nation. Every nation should have its own state. Our state will be revived if we unite. If we unite, we will demolish the power of the occupiers and its Moscow henchmen. Dear compatriots, in 1552, Russian occupiers conquered our state. They destroyed our capital, Kazan, and then all the republics of Edel Euro were captured. Genocide and forcible baptism were carried out on numerous occasions against our people. Since then, our peoples have been living in a colonial situation. And today, Russian occupiers are doing the same thing in the state of Ukraine, destroying its inhabitants. I appeal now to all nations of Idel Ural. We will create guerrilla groups and fight together against the Muscovite occupiers.